Hello, welcome back to everyone and welcome back to the Public Play Space Symposium. Right before the break, we counted on an extremely insightful panel on serious games for the co-design of the public space. And we will now go on with the third panel, which deals with the topic of gamification, play and community-based strategies. So conversations will be opened by Sara Candiracci, Associate Director at Arup and Inclusive and Resilient Cities Lead. Hello, Sara. So Sara works in the field of inclusive and resilient urban development and planning with a focus on vulnerable urban contexts. With the Real Play Coalition, which is a collaboration of LEGO Foundation, UNICEF, National Geographic and IKEA, Sara is leading the Reclaiming Play in Cities initiative, a, particip a participatory approach to design and implement play-based interventions in the urban space. Welcome Sara and thanks a lot for joining us. We will continue with Francesco Caldarola, who is a cultural and social innovation expert. Francesco is founder of Capital Sud, an association dedicated to social and cultural innovation within the field of urban regeneration, and worked as project manager at Matera European Capital of Culture 2019. He also curated an international urban game festival called Fusion. Well, welcome, Francesco. Welcome also to Mattia Thibault. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome also to Mattia Thibault, who is a researcher at the faculty of ICT of Tampere University in Finland. He is also a member of the, communication, of the gamification group and also an affiliate to the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies. So Mattia's research revolves around smart and playable cities from the perspective of play and gamification research, semiotics and critical speculative design. In particular, it focuses on how play can be a tool for bottom-up urban reappropriations and on the role of games and gamification in city making. So thanks, Mattia, welcome. And last but not least, Fabio Viola, founder of Tuo Museo, an international collective of artists working to break the boundaries between culture and interactive media. So Fabio is an author of books on the topics of gamification and playable cities, and leads the European Met Game projects on behalf of Fundación Alguero, bringing the play culture in urbanism. So welcome, Fabio, and thanks, of course, for joining us. So this panel will be moderated by Zan Gozen, where she is connected, hello Zan, lecturer and researcher at Breda University, and Davide Leone, member of CLAC, you all have seen him, seen him before, but also founder of, the, of Ugame. Ugame is a company developing game and game design to build playful experiences on the historical, artistic, cultural, environmental heritage. So the floor is yours. Thank, thanks to everyone for being here here and uh, Sara, you're more than welcome to share your screen. Thank you, Marco. Nice to meet you all. Um, so yeah, let me share my, my screen. Um, uh, this one. Can you? No, I don't think you're seeing it. No, we can see it. Perfect. Can you see? Yeah, we okay. see the entire PowerPoint. Can you see the, the full screen okay. now? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, first of all, thanks, Marco, uh, and uh, for, for inviting me to, to this symposium. And I'm very happy to, to be here and to share the, the work we have been doing and the experience that um, Arup has in the field of play in, in cities and, and public space. Um, so just uh, uh, some, some, uh, some key points for, for today. Um, basically, I'd like to share with you the work uh, that um, the, basically to share with you who the Real Play Coalition is, why the, the Real Play Coalition exists, uh, and, and also uh, what we have been doing over the past years in the space of uh, uh, play in cities to make uh, children um, have access to, to more play and learn opportunities in, in cities. So um, just to start, so basically, as, as Marco mentioned, the Real Play Coalition is a, is a global partnership uh, whose core members are UNICEF, National Geographic, IKEA, LEGO Foundation, and ARUP. It was uh, created in 2018 uh, with ambition of creating a global movement to reclaim the right to play in children's life. Um, I'm not sure if you know, Arup is a, uh, where I work, is a, is a, a global multidisciplinary firm working in the space of urban design, planning, and engineering. I'm an urban planner as background. Um, and the work we are doing uh, within the Real Play, Real Play Coalition to provide uh, technical support and advice in the space, in the, in the topic, of course, of, of cities of the built environment. 
And we are doing this by developing strategies, uh, methods, tools uh, um, to basically help city authorities and urban practitioners to embed play-based principle into design, uh, into decision-making and also into, into planning with the idea to support the designers implementation and upscaling of play activations in cities globally. Uh, because our aim, not only as ARU, but as the coalition, is to create healthier, more inclusive cities, uh, not only for children to try, but also with benefits for, for the broader community. Just quickly, uh, basically, the, the work of the Reapply Coalition is driven by three uh, key commitments. One is to create knowledge about play and prove the importance of play uh, through the generation of evidence. Uh, the second principle or commitment is to embed play-based principle into urban design and planning. And also uh, the third one is to incorporate play into children's daily life. And by doing this, uh, we can we also are trying to contribute to the achievement of several SDGs and, and different targets, while, of course, uh, uh, ensuring that children well-being and development is, is ensured. But why the coalition, why we think that play is important? Uh, as I said, the, the main reason for, for creating this coalition is because we, we truly believe uh, that play is essential, not only for children well-being, but also for the development, for their skills development, because it helps, as there is a lot of evidence in relation to this, that it helps strengthening the social emotional skills of children, the physical abilities also to build their resilience. Also, what we saw is that outdoor play and interaction is also critical because it generates uh, numerous benefits for communities and cities as play spaces, uh, they, they become uh, uh, quite frequently a focal community hubs where residents can engage uh, with one another. In fact, play is often associated with higher level of volunteering and community action. It helps improving social cohesion uh, between different ethnic groups, uh, and also it helps reducing uh, incidence of antisocial behavior and, and vandalism. And what was so that play is often seen as something that is uh, confined to playgrounds or children facilities, but uh, as Arab as at the Real Play Coalition, we see uh, uh, that play goes, should go beyond that. That they all, the all the entire built environment actually can offer a critical play and formal learning opportunity for children. In fact, what we saw through a research that we conducted a few years ago is that where steps have been taken to enhance children' experience of the city there are different benefits, and not only for children, but for the wider, wider society. Because a child-friendly approach to urban planning can be an effective way for, to address different agendas and to bring together different agendas and create multiple benefits, including health and well-being, sustainability, climate resilience, and, and safety. And also can be a catalyst for uh, urban innovation and also local economic uh, development. But as we know, play is a, is a silent emergency uh, because play is struggling to find a place in the lives of many children today. Uh, and low play lives and play poverty are seen across all strata of society and socioeconomic levels uh, around the world. And the barriers are many. Here we mentioned some. On one hand, there is urbanization uh, trends uh, uh, globally, which are reducing uh, access to open spaces for play. And we can say, and I saw in different articles in The Guardian, that children are being increasingly designed out of cities, of streets, public space, in neighborhood, and also housing estates design. To this, of course, there is the issue of urban lifestyle that's been changing over the past decades. There is a growing prevalence of insecurity and parental risk aversion. There is an increasing role played by technology in our lives and also a key problem that we are all face about time scarcity and children are, have, uh, have, have a lot of this issue because they're too busy and they don't have actually time for play in many cases. On the other hand, what we saw is that also city authorities, professionals, as, uh, like uh, urban planners, housing developers, engineers, they also have a limited understanding on how they work and the built environment relate to children's needs and how they can actually, through their work, embed play uh, in their uh, decision-making, planning, or policy development. Also, there is uh, limited evidence and knowledge on the state of play in cities and its role in, in child development. And, and of course, uh, uh, on top of these barriers, uh, as we I think we all know, uh, COVID-19 has been uh, um, devastating um, for, for children, for youth uh, in particular, because it's, it's disrupted uh, their schooling, their learning opportunities, also most importantly, the opportunity to interact with other peers and friends. Um, 
and uh, and so as we know less opportunity for play uh, uh, also um, and also for physical activity interaction has a huge impact on children well-being uh, physical and mental well-being um, and also COVID has changed radically the way we see and experience the public space. In fact, it has turned social mixing into a threat that we, we need to, uh, to avoid. Um, and urban disparities uh, because of, of COVID uh, are now in the, in the spotlight. So uh, as Arup, as, as, a, as a real play coalition, uh, we uh, have been, uh, as Marco mentioned, we've been uh, leading uh, what is called the Reclaiming Play in Cities uh, initiative, uh, which involved at the beginning the development of the urban play framework, which is a planning tool to understand how various uh, urban systems relate to child learning through play experience and a, a tool also to support the design uh, and implementation of uh, play-based uh, initiatives. And the, the initiative has been uh, implemented now in three cities, um, uh, Cape Town, London and, and Milan, and we use the urban play framework to undertake an assessment and also to design uh, interventions. Uh, this is the example of Cape Town, where actually we started. In Cape Town, we decided to work in an informal settlement because the, the dynamics there are completely different. We wanted to understand what play is and means in a, in a context like uh, um, an informal settlement in Cape Town. And we worked there in collaboration with a, a local organization, uh, which is called Ikayami. And uh, we conducted uh, a participatory assessment that uh, it happened before COVID, obviously, uh, but uh, um, we, we organized workshops with the community members, with children. Uh, also, we ran a, a photo con contest for children from primary school to understand their perception about play, also the danger they face in their, in their neighborhood. And also to identify then uh, through a co-creation process, to identify possible solution where sometimes it's very difficult to find solution in contexts like, like that. But we managed to find a, a way forward uh, because uh, through the insight from the assessment, uh, we identified the opportunity to develop uh, a, a play network. Uh, so basically we activated uh, and reclaim outdoor courtyard hubs. And, uh, um, and we designed this uh, uh, network of play spaces and each play space is, uh, was designed to develop a different skill set through play activities. So social, emotional, cognitive skills, and they're all connected through a network. And the good thing is that we are actually implementing this uh, um, play uh, activation. We started before COVID, but had to stop. And now we are resuming the work this month. Uh, we also did the same, uh, the same process in London, where we work with uh, the Royal Town Planning Institute and also with the Barnet Council, also going through the same process of uh, participatory mapping, co-creation, co-design, and we uh, produce uh, a paper file report that is now available that we launched uh, last week. And the good thing is that in the, in the same neighborhood we are launching tomorrow, actually, uh, we start a new initiative uh, that is uh, in collaboration with Change X, that is a com community play challenge. Basically, we are giving a grant to community groups in, uh, in, in Barnet, but also in two other boroughs, uh, to implement uh, community-led initiatives, and they will be inspired by different case studies that uh, the Change Act, that is this platform, will, uh, will, uh, will make available, um, and, and then we will support in the implementation. In Milan, also, we are working, uh, collaborating there with the City Authority of Milan uh, through their Resilience Education Department, and also there we are, uh, we, we are working there in the neighborhood Rogoredo, Santa Lucia, uh, because there is a, a, a high number of young population there and also a transformation process that is happening. And so we conducted assessment this time uh, during COVID. So it's been an online workshop with children, but we managed to run a photo contest as well and co-creation activities. And, and quite just recently, we managed to organize also actually an in-person workshop, a, a play activation in, in the street of Rogoredo, uh, using uh, different tools that we develop in collaboration with, uh, uh, with LEGO. Uh, there is, this is another initiative that we ran last year, is the Real Play City Challenge that we run in collaboration with Placemaking X. Basically, it's an international competition or context for city authorities, city makers. They basically submitted different ideas on how they address play and opportunities for play in their cities and their context. And so then this international jury was created and we identified some winners uh, from the city side was uh, the city of Tirana that is, uh, is amazing for the work they're doing on child-friendly cities and then different other uh, initiatives. Um, and, and now the next uh, that we're starting uh, in September is also developing 
with the learning from this uh, uh, design competition, the a design guide um, that will be available uh, next year. Uh, to, to support the design implementation of a, a play-based intervention in, in cities. And, uh, and to conclude, this is uh, uh, another initiative that we launched last week, uh, is, a, is a, a collaboration with uh, the Resilient Cities Network, um, looking at how play can actually contribute our resilience. And uh, we identify seven ambassador cities, which are Belfast, Colima, Houston, Milan, Montreal, Rabala, and Bill to be busy uh, and uh, we are together with them uh, we are uh, trying to push the the play agenda across these cities as, and beyond because they already are, these are cities that are already implementing great initiatives in relation to child friendly cities and we launched a survey uh, last week that is available on the link here i'm happy to share through marco later on uh, to basically collect data for city authorities uh, uh, play workers and uh, and uh, also urban practitioners to generate more evidence in relation to play in cities and and the knowledge the insight will then develop uh, a, a pledge to play that will be launched uh, at the world economic forum next uh, uh, next year uh, so this uh, just like a brief introduction that uh, I'm, i was happy to share and thanks again marco for for the opportunity um, and I'm available if you have any question or if you want to follow up on, on any of these things. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara. It was great to see the work you're developing. It's uh, fantastic to see also such uh, that big players are actually collaborating and working on uh, such a relevant topic that we know that has not been the focus for many time of urbanism and in general sociologists. So that's also that's also great. Um, we are going to have Q&A and uh, conversation at the end of all the presentations. Um, I'm very, very glad to give now the word to the next uh, speaker, who is Francesco Caldarola. Francesco, whenever you want, you can uh, share your screen. Can you hear me? Because I can't see my screen, my uh, camera working anymore. Okay. Now I can. Okay. Yes, first of all, sorry for connecting from the beach, but we actually envy uh, you a bit. This is <laughs> not one of, those, one, of, <laughs> one of those fake backgrounds, it's a, it's a real one. I kind of really forgot I had this, um, this thing organized for today, but I'm, I'm here and glad to share all the, all the things I'm going to share now. Um, thank you for the invitation, first of all, to Davide and uh, and hello to Davide and also Fabio that I know in person, the only two people I know in person. I'm uh, really, uh, it's really sad sometimes to uh, see all those people we are uh, meeting in these chats that we don't meet in person, but anyways, <laughs> this is one of those problems we're facing with the pandemic. Okay, um, this should be, my presentation, can you see it? If I uh, share it like this, do you see it full screen? Yes, we can see full screen. Okay. You can Perfect. see the browser, uh, but it's fine. Maybe you can close the below row for the, of the download so you can have a, a better visualization. Mm -hmm. You see it? All right, should be- like Close this. to mostra tutto. Okay, perfect, yeah. I think no, it's right. And now, do you see the the presenter, or is it still okay? It's it's fine. We just okay. See perfect. No, because I opened the other another window on, on top. Of it. Okay. So hello, everybody, again. Um, I'm Francesco Calderola, and in this occasion, um, I am uh, speaking as a former uh, project manager for Matera Capital. European Capital of Culture 2019, uh, for, especially for this project um, that I uh, coordinated, it was called uh, Fusion Urban, Urban Games Festival. And uh, this is my little experience about uh, urban games. Um, and uh, the, the very um, important thing about this project is, first of all, that we managed to create um, a cooperation project between the two European capitals of culture of 2019, who were uh, Matera and uh, Plovdiv in Bulgaria. And um, this was a festival uh, organized in the, in the where we was 
we were organizing also some other activities in cooperation with uh, the European Capital of Culture of Plovdiv. So this was part of a, of a bigger program of uh, activities organized in cooperation with the other European Capital of Culture. And I'm happy to say that this is one of the very few occasions in which this happened in the history of European Capitals of Culture that when they are uh, uh, managing the title in the same year, um, it's very rare to see uh, projects and programs organized together. So this was one of the one of our first aims uh, in this project. Um, Fusion was a festival organized uh, in collaboration also with a, a, a company called um, Department Gear from Poland, which was a team of curators of Urban Games. And it lasted six days uh, in total, uh, involved two cities with 21 games, which we selected through an open call for game designers from all around Europe. Um, and actually, this was, uh, as I said before, part of a bigger program that we called Plovdiv and Matera together for an open future, because um, together was the slogan of Plovdiv 2019 and open future was the slogan of uh, Matera 2019. So we kind of merged the two experiences together and challenged our curators to find uh, solutions to organize the same games in two different cities, which was uh, especially uh, challenging in some way. Um, yeah, uh, you can deny justice, beauty, truth, goodness, mind, God. You can deny seriousness, but not game. This was uh, the kind of principle we started from. Um, because we believe, uh, we believed, and still believe, games can be uh, some sort of um, leverage for the cities to uh, implement new discussions and to uh, grow in of um, collective intelligence. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we uh, started uh, this festival, setting some uh, specific objectives, who were like. Uh, involving local communities in playful activities because Matera also had organized before some, some other urban games and there are some organizations that actually um, work in the, in the field of, uh, of games in Matera, which is not so common in a city that is uh, 60,000 inhabitants. Um, uh, that there are many organizations working on game, and game design and, and urban games, uh, encouraging local people to create and produce different projects in their cities. This was related to a capacity building action we uh, we organized with those organizations I was mentioning before. And revitalizing abandoned and isolated city areas and transforming the attitude towards them and rethinking place making uh, in conventional city areas. This was because uh, we uh, tried to organize this festival uh, in different areas of the city. I will talk about it uh, in details uh, in a couple of slides. And, um, the, the idea was to also bring playful activities in unconventional areas of the city uh, and of course create creating an awareness and common ground around the world of urban games and games design because still uh, in some areas of Italy this is the perception um, of urban games and, and uh, uh, how games can change uh, cities and attitudes to people it's very uh, very little. So we started from this question, um, trying to ask people, uh, when was the last time you played a game? And if you remember the pleasant excitement at the beginning, the shivers down your spine when you solved the most difficult riddle and the unlimited uh, happiness when you finally won. This was a sort of uh, a phrase we shared uh, before launching the campaign for uh, this Urban Games Festival uh, to uh, recall to the minds of people how, how uh, nice is to play, how, how interesting it is to play games with other people and how uh, challenging it can be uh, to do it even in, uh, in uh, urban spaces, in public spaces. Um, so we decided to uh, establish um, one festival center in the middle of the city. So this, this one you see in the wooden structure is, it was built uh, in collaboration with the Open Design School in Matera, which is another of the pillar projects of Matera 2019. And in collaboration with them, we designed this specific structure that was, uh, th it was thought to uh, be uh, built in the middle of the of the city center, uh, where we gathered all the participants of the games that were taking place in the city center, and then another one exactly uh, with the same modules uh, in the periphery. So this is um, the building you see below. This is the sea behind. Sorry, is the is the 
headquarter of Open Design School in Matera, which is situated in very in the very um, uh, suburbs of the city. <clears throat> um, we and I'm going to conclude. I will be very brief because uh, I really want to open the discussion about the uh, importance of uh, organizing such an experience in uh, in Matera and uh, and uh, also rural areas uh, like in the south of Italy. Uh, we started from um, three different uh, topics that were uh, digital culture and its its impact on people's lives because um, we know uh, that digital revolution is, is uh, something that is not new. Um, we got used to all this um, uh, involvement of technologies like uh, IoT, VR and AR uh, in our lives and in our uh, ordinary lives. And we wanted to prove that um, there can be an hybridation between the use of technologies and the uh, also un understanding the city and exploring the cities in new ways. So we started uh, also uh, involving game designers that uh, presented games with uh, some specific technological solutions that help people to um, uh, understand and explore the city in a more uh, interactive way. Um, so we are, have challenged uh, ourselves in understanding what are the changes that technologies uh, can bring to our lives and uh, what are the opportunities and threats that uh, digital culture bring to our society. Uh, another topic was, uh, uh, of course, uh, center and peripheries. We always uh, wanted to, um, let's say, uh, dismiss this discussion about the uh, um, polarizations uh, of uh, centers and peripheries. So we really um, make, made an effort to organize uh, different games in different areas of the city and then establishing those two festival houses, if we can call them, um, in different areas of the city, one in the middle of the city and one very in the very suburbs. Um, this was uh, also uh, useful to engage in the discussion on uh, what, what, does, what does it mean to um, to be a periphery uh, nowadays and uh, what are the benefits also of uh, living in the peripheries and exploring uh, the, the uses of people in, in the peripheries. And we managed to engage a lot of people in the local communities more in the, in the peripheries than we actually did in the center where other people, tourists and um, visitors uh, engaged in the games. Um, and finally, um, we started thinking, uh, can games uh, change the world. This was one of the other challenges we started uh, thinking about um, because also we uh, explored the dimension of uh, the temporary citizenship in Matera, which is something we, we never wanted to call uh, the tourists uh, with this name. We always started thinking about uh, tourism as a temporary citizenship you gain when you go to a place. So um, this is also something we reflected upon and um, uh, starting to grow uh, the responsibility, the race responsibility that people have when they visit the place. And we think that through games and through play, um, of course, you can uh, also stimulate this responsibility towards the, uh, the city and uh, the place you live, also in the place you, you visit. And um, finally, uh, maybe um, I will show a very brief video and then I will conclude. We cannot hear the sound, but I guess oh. uh, it's, uh, probably it's uh, an ambient sound or in any case, we can see perfectly the kind of experience you were sharing, which is actually great. I'm trying to, to put the this one on the microphone. But no, 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 but yeah, unless you have, uh, you had no, it's, it's only music behind. It's only it's actually it's nice with the music. It's, it's nicer, but <laughs> that's perfect. You can just whistle it for us. <laughs> Wonderful. 
So yeah, in the meantime, time is tight. So we'll also take advantage of uh, this moment to thank Francesco for his uh, very nice contribution and congratulations for the wonderful work that they have been developing. It's uh, again, great to see how this novel approach is brought to a, a real case study in a, in a city and taking advantage of a European event. So to broaden the audience of that. So now the next uh, speaker is Mattia Thibault, who I invite also to share the, the screen um, and uh, open his microphone. Thanks, Francesco. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here in such a good company. So again, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, let me just start my stopwatch so I will not speak over time. <clears throat> My name is Mattia Thibault. I'm a senior researcher at Tampere University in Finland. And uh, today I will talk to you about my project Reclaim, <coughs> which is a keyword that has already emerged in the presentation of Sarah, and uh, especially on the concept of playing in the city with the city and for the city. So this project Reclaim has been developed within the gamification group. The gamification group is a research group formed by more than 30 researchers from three universities in Finland. It's one of the most published, uh, most cited, and largest groups uh, working on gamification. We have a very diverse backgrounds, both in terms of nationality, but also of expertise. We have uh, engineers, social scientists, humanists, designers, a bit of everything. Uh, if you want to know more about our group, please uh, just uh, Google gamification group and you will find all the information there. And uh, in this group, we work on gamification, uh, sensu, so in the sort of largest possible exception. So we're also interested, for example, in how new technologies like extended reality or wearable technologies can create uh, playful or gameful experiences, but also, for example, of gamification in education, uh, in um, urban development and so on and so forth. We are working on many projects. I just show here a few of them chosen basically because they're the nicest logos. So some, for example, Unite is a very large uh, Academy of Finland project of, uh, that includes several actors among which several companies working in forests that is dedicated to sort of rethink the possible engagement and uh, experiences in forest and uh, forestry areas. Uh, for different actors. Of course, here in Finland, most of the country is covered in forests, so it's quite important. And then we have, uh, well, all sort of projects dedicated to virtual reality, to wearable technologies, to esports, to education about data and data visualization, but also, for example, training in emotional skills through gamification, and so on and so forth. There are really many, so I will not uh, spend too much time speaking about this, but this was to give you an idea of the context, let's say, of the project Reclaim. So Reclaim, whose full title is Urban Gamification for City Reappropriation, was a two-year uh, project funded by the European Union, a Marie's Klodowska Curie Individual Fellowship. It was led by myself and supervised by Professor Juho Amari, who is the leader of the gamification group, co-supervised by Judith Van Kamp from Bach and uh, by Gabriele Ferge <coughs> from Amsterdam University of Technology. It is a project that ran two years between September 2018 and September 2020. And well, the main scientific uh, goal and achievement was, <coughs> apologies, to try to build a solid, usable, and multidisciplinary framework, both for the study, but also for the design and the realizations of activities that involve city play and aim at reclaiming public urban spaces. So if Saya before was telling about reclaiming play in the city, this is more about reclaiming city through play. So the core concept of this project was that of urban gamification. So what do I mean when I speak about urban gamification? Well, gamification in, uh, by the definition that we use here, the gamification group is, does not much uh, to do with game element or game strategies, but is more about attempting to design or to afford a playful or gameful experience in a non-game context. So it's not sort of linked about what kind of elements or strategies or mechanics we're using, but it is um, focusing on the experience that people have in a certain situation. And in particular, how we can make these experiences more playful or gameful when the context is itself is not that of a game. 
So if we speak about urban gamification, the non-game context is, well, the CG itself. So according to this definition, basically every playful activity that invests public spaces in the city is a form of urban gamification. There is, for example, uh, a activity of urban gamification that I'm sure that the majority of you have engaged at least once in the past, which is the game do not walk on the pavement lines. So when we're walking on the sidewalk and we're just trying to avoid the lines on the ground. This is a playful activity that we're sort of um, um, overlapping to a normal activity that is that of moving to the city in order to make it more interesting and less boring. So in order to gamify our commuting or our movement to the city. So if we think about activities of urban gamification, there are many. I put here some pictures. I cannot really spend enough time to talk about all of them. But well, the first two are projects by uh, the um, uh, project um, uh, Fun Theory by Volkswagen that use playfulness to try to induce uh, pro-social behavior, so healthy behavior, like the piano staircase that is meant to sort of push people to use the stairs instead of the escalator. The next two pictures are from the playable cities in Bristol, which try to create moments of social aggregation through playfulness. Then in the middle row, you can see several uh, activities of do-it-yourself urbanism from the uh, uh, pedestrian crossing that you can bring with you and as a carpet and put wherever you want to yarn bombing or parking day. <clears throat> and then finally, you have several sort of traditional forms of playful activities like parkour, skating, flash mobs and pride parades, which have a strong uh, carnivalesque and playful uh, character, even if they, of course, are fighting for very serious uh, political uh, agendas. So this is just to show how many different um, forms of play actually happen in cities and that can be considered forms of urban gamification because they are acting on the city itself. So first of all, what we did in this project was try to move away from the idea of a sort of top-down and manipulative gamification, a gamification that aims at changing the behavior of the citizens and telling them what to do as if the designers would know what's, what is best and the, the citizens should sort of be manipulated to play uh, in order to do the right thing. So to do so, uh, I used uh, the concept of punk gamification, which is a gamification that aims at sort of freeing the citizens and using play as a tool for while well, doing what they want in the urban spaces. But we also made use of critical design and do-it-yourself urbanism in order to create uh, a more sustainable and more ethical uh, in a more uh, way, <clears throat> in a way, political form of urban gamification. So through these urban gamification... Oh, sorry, Mattia, just one minute left. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, fair enough. So it's not... Um, um, sorry, I lost what I was saying. Well, urban gamification can become an instrument to challenge the urban status quo and to allow bottom-up alternative forms for engagement in public space. So what we have done was to conduct a series of uh, expert interviews in order to ground it in the well, experience or lived experience of experts, both traditional ones and uh, some, as you can see in the pictures, made by using a board game. We uh, studied several case studies, for example, gamification solution for sustainable cities, uh, gamification with tourist trends. So for example, uh, dark tourism or tourism uh, related to video games. Also, gamification is a strategy to prevent, uh, to preserve memory in urban spaces, urban spaces in VR, and what kind of playfulness in urban spaces still happened uh, during COVID-19, despite the many regulations. And then we also uh, created some practical urban gamification projects, in particular Jurassic Tampere and Hulk, that were meant to explore different types of emergent playful interactions and uh, that are not trying to change the behavior of the citizens, but sort of bring playfulness in the city spaces. You can find more details about uh, this project and its results in the final report of Reclaim that was just published a few months ago. It's open access, you can access it to this link. I will share it later in the, in the chat if you're interested. And just to conclude, as uh, the project uh, is sort of finished, but is not uh, in fact really dead, there are several spin-offs that are coming out of it. One is the playable, sustainable, inclusive, the future of Mars cities track in MindTrack Academic. We had the first um, edition this summer, it was very successful. 
And so it would become sort of an annual appointment for people interested in exploring how playfulness will play a role in the future of smart cities. There is the Ludo Space project that is uh, funded by the Center of Excellence for Game Culture Studies that is dedicated to study how uh, spaces that are designed to host playfulness, like arenas, casinos, and theme parks, can teach us to design more playful, playful spaces. And finally, transurbanism, that is a series of projects of speculative design dedicated to imagine what would be the city of the futures and uh, especially the place of playfulness in that. So thank again, thank you very much for your attention. I think I was under the 10 minutes that I was asked for. And uh, it was perfect. Thank you very much, Mattia. It was really great to, to see your, your work. And uh, also, again, great to see how this topic is touched and dealt with by different people and in different fields of research. So that's actually fantastic for our conversation. Now I'm happy to give the word to Fabio, who I see is also connected to share your screen. Thank you, Fabio. Hi, thanks for inviting me. I'd like to share what I learned in the last 20 years as game designers, mainly uh, in a digital world, but in the last years, even applying game design to the physical spaces. I mean, in our work as an artistic collective that use play to activate and engage communities, we conceive two equals levels of space, material and immaterial. For us, they are both relevant in the everyday life of people. Today, physical and digital represent two terrains of experimentation and public participation. And in fact, in our project, we try to integrate these two dimensions, let's call digital kind of project. And for example, playing through the digital highways leads you to create experiences usable by an international pool and to get out of the tyranny of auto-referentiality, self-referentiality. I mean, when we, we, we work for only for local communities, we often tend to deliver the same kind of cultural background and we, we recognize the equal level of social, emotive, and interactive kind of, of skills. So how do I make the content about a city or a museum relevant and memorable in the, in the lives of those who live 10,000 kilometers far? Uh, and we need to, to recognize these differences. I'm, for example, I'm thinking about father and son project we carried out in Naples with the Nas National Archaeological Museum where over 4 million people from every corner of the planet approached the local stories through universal themes. I mean, an interactive narrative that enhances uh, the player's agency and evolves based on their decisions. This kind of project, I think, teaches us the importance of balancement between the mechanic drive driven and story driven playful kind of experience uh, and honestly I'm pretty much obsessed with what I call story doing uh, because actually we need that people act and interact inside our our kind of playful experience uh, in fact if you have to give um, a definition of video game but even uh, about the overall idea of game uh, probably the games is a, play, a place where people taking constantly meaningful decision. We have to, to bring people to be activated. They don't have just to, um, they don't have to be just spectator, but they should be spectator or spectator inside uh, the field, um, the field of play. Um, but. How does this digital, digital experiences impact of, over physical spaces? I think, first of all, by helping to make certain space reproduced digitally from the real relevant again for residents or temporary uh, citizens. And then by creating convergences, for example, in father and son, it's possible to play and complete the experience uh, on your couch in Bangladesh, but, but only by physically going to the museum, you can unlock additional in-game content. We, we had more uh, over uh, 50,000 people often coming from all around Europe visiting the museum. And, and for example, with Assassin's Creed 2 set in, uh, uh, in Italy, for example, in Monteregione, still actually 20% of the tourist flow comes from video games players. 
it's amazing. We, we, we talk about 100,000 of people that knew the physical space through the lens of video games and then decide to go there. And again, they take pictures and video and reshare that physical space, creating a physical and digital short circuit all, all, over, all over the time. Um, an expansion of, of this concept is a project realized in Florence a few years ago. Uh, the, uh, the main the main purpose was okay. Yeah, this is the slide. The main purpose was delocalize the tourist flow. And how uh, you have to visit the period, the suburbs. Uh, you have to go outside the, the Florence city center in order to collect cards. And cards are useful to challenge against players all around the world. So again, this kind of project combined physical presence, physical exploration, physical activation, and at the same time. It can be played from all around the world. You don't need to be physically uh, all the time in Florence, but you can even start playing with the starting deck, 50, 50, um, 50 cards, uh, without being ever being in Florence. So for me, this is the um, the best contribution from physical and and digital. Uh, instead, of course, physical games brings enormous advantage in activating communities through synesthesia. And I think we need to research that when we work on, on physical uh, on physical framework. For, for example, I'm leading a, a new project funded uh, um, called Met Games. Uh, we received more than two million euro uh, last year, and, and we are developing 40 games all across Italy, Jordan, Lebanon, and Spain. And it's and this experience has been pretty much useful to me because I learned how important it is to uh, create a balancement between uh, an authorial creative process made by specialists and an um, participatory kind of project. Half of the games comes from um, the citizens. Uh, we, we granted uh, 20 games on, on 40 and all the games are split around three phases. We are pretty much focused on what happened before people reach the urban space, when people are inside the urban space, and what people do when they go back to their places after visiting the urban space. So all the projects are split uh, in these three phases because this is the way we create a circular engagement, the pre, the during, and uh, the post experience. Uh, last but, but not least, um, we, we can generate huge impacts on the urban spaces. For example, I cooperate with Luca Comics and Games. It's the largest participatory event in Europe and help us to understand the impacts of synchronicity, uh, synchronicity, synchronicity and asynchronicity. What, what they mean is people spend months in order to prepare themselves. They became cosplayers and for five days, they invade Luca. We have 100,000 people that will pay 20 or uh, tickets in order to be there. And it's very, very important. So working together with local communities and with thematic international communities. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio, for your contribution as well. So now I'm really glad to give the word to to Zan and to Davide to start our conversation. I would like also to remind to all the attendees that they can use the Q&A panel uh, here in Zoom to make their questions so they can have a better answer directly and more coordinated there than the chat. Thank you very much, David and Zan. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists because it was really, really interesting to uh, hear uh, your, your interventions. And um, well, uh, we have not so much time, so uh, I will cut uh, many of the things uh, I wanted to, to, to say to you. Uh, but what I think is that what you're talking about, it was about the, the game as a, the games as a tool to access, or also uh, how to access to game. Because uh, in in the end uh, you um, you focus about uh, uh, the the right to play, but also uh, to the game as a, as a new uh, as a new key to open other worlds, to understand other things, 
to go inside the city and to change what are which are the the, the meanings of that city and however i i want to ask you uh, i want to ask you uh, which is the roles of your communities inside your games uh, because uh, you face different communities in different places and so uh, i am really curious about the the way you involve the communities inside games inside your experience Uh, <clears throat> I can start if uh, nobody else wants to go first. <clears throat> so thank you for the question and, and thank you for, for mentioning meaning making that as a semiotician, I'm always happy when someone brings it up because I think it's one of the central uh, topics of the importance of playfulness in urban spaces. The fact that it allows us to sort of rewrite them fictionally when we don't really have the opportunity to actually change them physically. But for the community uh, involvement that you were mentioning, this is for me maybe one of the biggest challenge if we want to have a punk approach to gamification. Because it's easy in a way to involve them when we know what we want them to do. But if we want to use play to let them reappropriate the city, this can also be dangerous because some form of playfulness are not necessarily good ones, like bullism is a form of playfulness. Bullism is very playful. It uses jokes, it uses pretend, it uses uh, sort of group um, group formation, etc. But this is not something that we want to promote. And if we look, for example, at the violence that we just witnessed between uh, football supporters, we can see very well that this is not what we want in our cities when we speak about, you know, urban play. And so I, I don't have an answer to your question. That's what I'm trying to say. But I think that it's very um, key, at least for my research, to try to understand in what ways we can sort of give the power to the citizens to play, but at the same time, ensure that this power will not be used to discriminate or to vandalize, but it will be used to revitalize and reappropriate. Maybe if I can add something, because I'm not sure if the, the question was open to everyone, but. Uh, maybe just to add to, to what Mattia uh, just said, um, in relation to the approach we use, we put uh, very much the community and also children at the core of our approach. So basically engaging and involving uh, community groups, children, caregivers from different also age groups uh, into uh, both the assessment. Uh, so basically to understand the opportunities and challenges that in a, in a certain borough, neighborhood uh, or community exist. Um, and, uh, and also into the co-creation of solutions with them. So with, as we, had, we tested this approach in, in Cape Town, London, Milan, and I mean, it's, it's quite at the core of the co-creation process. And I think that should be the way forward uh, in terms of when we talk about play in cities, because uh, it's important to understand play uh, beyond, of course, the playground. I think we all agree with that, but also looking at what is the expectation of different groups in the society, so not only children, um, because I think play is for everyone, not only for children. Um, and of course, we are all promoting a, a healthy um, uh, type of play because uh, it must create positive outcomes and not, of course, uh, um, challenges, <laughs> more challenges. So I think, and the, the participation of communities uh, sometimes is something that is not something nice to do. It's something that we'll all have to do in different ways and in different stages of a project cycle, uh, because it's key to really shape and design and create or develop also policies, not only solutions that really address the existing challenges and the existing opportunities. Also because what we saw also coming from children, they come up with great ideas. Also the smaller kids, they can come up with great ideas. And of course, you always have to, when engaging communities, you always have to manage expectations uh, of course, it's not possible to take on board everything uh, because they start talking about swimming pools in, you know, in the square or like unicorns all over the places. So, of course, um, now I'm just you know exaggerating, but the point is that we 
it's not possible to take on board everything. So it is very important to engage communities with organizations who knows the community um, and with also supporting you know, people. Like if you work in particular in communities that are particularly challenging because very vulnerable, you need to also have the, the support from a sociologist or a psychologist to deal with certain challenges that children or families are facing. So I think it should be basically at the core of everything we do from design, but also in terms of policy um, and decision making. And maybe one thing I can add um, is that in the experience of um, organizing the Urban Games Festival in Matera, I'm not an Urban Games expert, I kind of became kind of uh, uh, familiar with the with the game world uh, through this this project I coordinated and the experience we had is also that in my opinion games are perceived as something that is especially for kids until you discover there is a serious way you can play games and there's um, serious consequences you can uh, apply to society through um, some sort of um, uh, playful activities so Um, do you st still listen to me? Yeah, we can. I, I have this weird connection. I don't know why it just collapses sometimes. Um, and basically that um, playing uh, for creating uh, new scenarios and uh, creating new, um, uh, let's say, impact to the city is somehow more intriguing for adults. So this, is, this was something we uh, discovered organizing some games were more um, more kind of workshops uh, with playful activities that then led to some um, some ideas at least scenarios of impact you can have on on the city. We, I'm not uh, sure we had some the possibility to really uh, impact on on um, on the city uh, dynamics, let's say. But at least we explored the possibility. Okay, so connection got blocked, unfortunately. Probably the location on the beach was not helpful. Okay, Francesco, we have yeah, lost you again. I, I kind of concluded anyway, so don't worry. It just really collapses every now and then. So. Yeah. I hope it was kind of clear, my, my concept. Yeah, I think it should be mandatory to hire a game designer for every municipalities or architecture film, et cetera, et cetera, because there are people who, who are used to think outside the box and, and without, without participants, without communities, games doesn't exist because it's a voluntary activity. And we need to have large communities because um, under my point of view, this is the only way to, to be sure that the game continues in the months, in the years. Otherwise, when the budget uh, ends, the game ends usually. When the European project ends, the game dies. When the, 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 the mayor changes, the debt activities dies, et cetera, et cetera. So we need that communities pushes forward the, the play experience, but we need that they are able to play, but are even able to create, to design games, because the only way is to have a democratization in the creating process. They don't have just to participate in the creative process, but have to be the, the tools in order to create and, and maintain and evolve the play experience. Thanks. Uh, just first of all, also to all the speakers. I think it is a shame we don't have enough time. We can continue talking about this as it's so relevant and I think so needed and, and current in today's life. I had a, a quick question as we're running out of time, maybe for all of you to open the floor. Um, I think some of the things that you spoke about, we, we think about different locations where you implement these games. We have different target markets or, or target groups and also for different types of problems where we use these games. And I was wondering in your extensive experience of, of implementing these games and using it to increase play also for participation, when do you see most effective um, like kind of solutions or things that these participants come up with or when do they engage most 
I was wondering, is it through when it's spontaneous activity, spontaneous play, or more structured play within these games? The floor is open. I don't know, Mattia, if you want to start again. Uh, sure, I can start again, but again, I'm not sure if I really have an answer to your question in the sense that the projects that I designed are generally sort of anti-solutionist. So they're not really looking for a solution to a specific problem, but they're more meant to uh, sort of uh, stimulate citizens to look at the city in a different way and to look at the possibilities of the city in a different way. And of course, the difficulty in this sort of projects is that you cannot always really have a feedback from the citizens. Like in the Jurassic Tamper project, we hit or we scattered for, for four to 500 small rubber dinosaurs in the public spaces for people to find. And we did notice that they all disappeared in a few hours. So people would find them and take them away. We saw some people taking pictures of them, but of course, as we're in Finland, they're generally quite shy, so they wouldn't do it until we were out of range, basically. But then we have no idea what they got out of it. <clears throat> we hope that this sort of made them look at a different way at the public spaces and you know notice different details and looking around and you know snapping off the sort of fog that often envelops us when we go to the city space. But we do not really know if that worked or not. I had, you know, some um, feedback from the players of the game, but not from the, you know, uh, unexpected participants that were the, the passers-by. So, again, that, that is my non-answer to, to your question, I guess. Not sure if someone would like to contribute to that or uh, have experience in what they've seen. Not, I won't follow up with a question, Marco, as I think we are running out of time, unfortunately. So I'll give the floor to you. Thank you, thank you very much. So thanks uh, again to all the speakers uh, of today, but of course to Mattia, Sara, Francesco and uh, Fabio. It was a great conversation and I would like again to highlight how different approaches are coming up uh, together around in, in this uh, in this today event, which is something that was our objective and we are really happy to foster a conversation and a debate about that. Again, with a European perspective as uh, Europe, uh, with the topic of public space, it's of course um, a very important field of experimentation, but also uh, with a connection, as Sarah shown, with other contexts in the world from which we can also learn a lot. So now we are going to jump into the last section session of uh, today. Again, thanks to all the speakers and uh, was a fantastic opportunity to have you all here. And thanks also to David and Zan.